So this section, we're going to look at auxiliary power units, commonly known in industry by the acronym APU. Uh, and this is, APUs are contained in ATA Chapter 49 is where you'll find uh, the information on it as well as often the, the different accessories that it powers directly, the, the items that are attached to it. So first off, we're going to look at what an APU is. So how many turbine engines are on a twin engine jet? Two? How many turbine engines? Three? I'm seeing some twos, I'm seeing some threes. So if a twin engine jet has an APU, it has a third engine, it's the APU itself. Okay? APU is a small turbo shaft engine. Uh, and the turbo shaft in this case, there really is no output shaft, it's just driving uh, a gearbox. So you have a turbine, you have a small turbo shaft engine. Uh, it's a it's a fixed shaft, or a, uh, there is no free power turbine, but it's the the compressor, the turbine, and then driving a gearbox. And its primary use is it's going to be providing electrical power, uh, and majority of the time it's used on the ground for on the ground as well as it can be a secondary source in flight, although typically somewhat limited. Uh, depending on the aircraft. So it can, often it can be up to service ceiling. In some cases, it can be limited in, in what it can do. Another function it does is it provides a pneumatic pressure source. And so these larger, and by larger, I'm talking regional jets, large, large corporate jets and bigger. Uh, the engines are too big to use an electric starter, except for the 787, which is an oddball. Uh, but most most uh, transport category aircraft that use you know that use turbofan engines are going to require a bleed air source to drive the starter. The starters are an air turbine, so we send pressurized air to a turbine that spins and gets the engine spinning. And so we have to have a pressurized air source. And the APU is is one of those sources. In some cases, you can use other other things like ground carts. And, and other things like that. But most of the time, this is what's gonna be used for that on the ground. It often can be used as well for heating and air conditioning, environmental control. And from a, a maintenance perspective on the ground, we can often use the APU bleed air uh, to provide that, that same airflow and then operate the pressurization system for testing and that kind of thing. So we can pressurize the aircraft on the ground. But it's in this capacity, and even in the electrical capacity, most of the time it's only used on the ground. The only time it would be used in the air is in a situation where, uh, say, there was deferred maintenance on one of the engine generators. Before the airplane can take off, it has to have two working generators. And if one of the engine generators isn't working, there are cases where you can run the APU the entire flight and use that as your second generator. It's not preferred. Uh, we, we would try to avoid it in the airlines, but it was something we could do to be able to operate the airplane and eventually get it back to a maintenance base instead of having to go fix it somewhere else. Uh, and we could even carry passengers with it in that condition as well. So it, it prevented us from having to, you know, we wouldn't cancel flights. We'd fly as few flights as possible this way. But again, it might be to get from some outstation small airport back to one of our main hubs where we have a maintenance base. And it could carry passengers. The big caveat with using the environmental control system, and particularly in the air, is that they're often limited in uh, altitude. So if, if we're using this as a bleed air source, uh, there's a limit to the altitude with which we can use it as a bleed air source. And then the other thing it can be used for, this bleed air can be used for emergency engine restarts. So if for some reason our engine shut down in flight, uh, and this has happened, uh, there have been cases where aircraft have flown through extremely bad weather or kind of the most famous cases are aircraft that have flown, flown through a volcanic ash cloud. And when they came out, they were able to restart engines using, uh, using the APU. But uh, it's, it's not very common. Obviously, we don't want to be shutting down engines on flight, but it is there. So what you see is a, you know, a typical or an, uh, here's an APU and kind of its different limits. And so 
Uh, and it is also based, in addition to altitude, it can be based on airspeed as well. Uh, because you get more airflow, the intakes for these are kind of scoop shaped. You can get more airflow at certain speeds. Uh, and kind of the assumption too here, you can see in flight, uh, ground flight, but up at altitude, we're, re we're never really going to be above about 12,000 feet unless we're flying, right? So there really is no like 20,000 foot zero speed, right? There's no 20,000 foot airport, for instance. You know, trading to take off from the top of Mount Everest. Uh, and so, you know, they, they look at it from below, you know, 12,000 feet and below. It can be used for basically anything, uh, electrical and bleed air. And then uh, you can see here the uh, ground and flight start, the maximum altitude you can use the APU to start the engines is 13,000 feet. And the reason for that is that takes a lot of air. And the higher you go, the, the thinner the air is, the harder the APU has to work to produce that bleed air. And so you know, it, can only, it can only produce enough bleed air to start the engines up to a certain altitude. Uh, up to 15,000 feet, that's the maximum where we can actually use it to supply any kind of bleed air. So be able to run environmental control and pressurization. So again, if for some reason our only bleed source on the aircraft was an APU and we wanted to fly passengers, we could not, our aircraft could not fly above 15,000 feet. The kicker with that is most of the time our aircraft flew between 20 and 30,000 feet. And they're much, much less efficient when they're flying at those low altitudes. So we didn't do that very often. And if we had the APU, you, you kind of got some weird stuff going on if the APU is your only bleed source. You have two engines that typically are your main bleed sources before that. We can actually start the APU. Now, it can run electrical above this range. Okay, this is just bleed. But we can actually start the APU up to 30,000 feet. And so in this range here, between 15,000 and 30,000, we can't run bleeds anymore, but we can still use electrical. So we can run the electrical anywhere in there. And then if we started at 30,000 feet, we can actually have it running and climb up to 37,000 feet in this case and be able to run electrical as well. So, you know, where I was talking about if we had deferred maintenance on one of the generators, one of the engine generators, and we have to use the APU, this aircraft has a service ceiling of 41,000 feet. Okay, so we could fly our airplane, you know, on engine generators at 35,000 feet, and it's not a big deal. We have one engine generator, one APU generator going. We can't use the bleed air at that point, but we can use it as the backup as that second generator. But we can't go above 37,000 feet, which this is out of a regional aircraft, for instance. It's probably rarely going to go above 37,000 feet. The flights are too short to justify going that high. But if we had a situation where, where engine shut down and we needed to restart, the, the crew would have to actually glide the plane back down. They'd get the APU started, glide it back down, and then once they got to 13,000 feet, then they could attempt an engine restart. But if they attempted an engine restart above that, you could over temp the APU and basically seize up the APU. You would melt it because you would take so much air away from it, there wouldn't be enough to cool it properly. Remember from your turbine engines class, how much air does a turbine engine typically use for internal cooling? versus combustion. So the air that goes through a turbine engine, how much of it is used for internal cooling? Anyone know? How much of it is used for combustion? So the air that actually goes through the core of the engine, only about 20% of it is used for combustion. The other 80% is all there for cool, keeping things cool so you don't melt it down. So when you start taking that bleed air away, when you start pulling from that 80%, right? the engine's gonna run a lot hotter very quickly because you're taking away the cooling air. So that's why it can't be used for high load, high bleed situations above 13 to 15,000 feet. But again, it can be run, we can run electrical in this case all the way up to 37,000 feet. So it can be a, a secondary generator. APUs are broadly broken up into two categories. We have smaller APUs, bigger APUs. So a smaller APU looks something like this. 
so kind of working our way in. I know it's not the greatest picture, but the inlet is right here in the middle. You can kind of see this. This would be a big square duct. That's our inlet. Okay. And then we go right here. And what section is this right here, right in the middle? This is our compressor. What kind of a compressor is it? This is a centrifugal compressor. So it's going to, the impeller is going to bring the air out into this section. What's this section called? This is kind of a forced review of, uh, of engines, if you haven't figured out the what? The diffuser, and then it goes into the combustion chamber. It's a reverse flow, annular. And then it goes into here. And what's this part? Turbine. So you can see the turbine and the, the compressor are basically like mated back to back right here. Right, and they're driving, there's this shaft in the middle, they're driving the shaft in the middle, comes out the left side of that compressor impeller, and it drives this gearbox here on the left. So that's its whole purpose, that whole, the whole point of that, of that turbine is to drive this compressor and drive this shaft to drive the gearbox. And then the exhaust goes out to the right, through the center. Okay? And then you'll have different items you can mount to the gearbox. Okay. So I talked about inlet, the compressor, there's the combustor, the turbine, and then the accessory gearbox. And what kind of things are gonna be mounted to that accessory gearbox? What do you think? What is this, what did I talk about? This has to supply, what does it have to do? What? It's got a generator, there's gonna be an AC generator on it. Okay, that is, on this one, probably that thing over there. Okay, what else is gonna be on there? There's going to be a starter. We have to get this thing started. Why can't we use a starter generator? We use starter generators on other airplanes. Why can't it be a starter generator for most transport aircraft? What do you think the starter has to run off of? It has to run off DC. It has to run off batteries, 28 volt. What is the generator going to produce? AC, 120 volt, 400 hertz, three phase, right? So you're going to have a separate, typically a separate starter generator. Again, 787, weird animal. That has AC starter generators on it. It's the only airplane you know, that does that. It's the same thing on the engines. They also have AC starter generators. Then you bleed. But the, all your other Boeings, 7, 707, 717, 720, 737, 737, 747, 757, 60, Airbus A318, 319, 320, 321, A330, A340, A350, they all use these kind of a thing. CRJ200, 700, 900, 1000, Embraer 170, 175, 190, 195. What? Those aircraft? Well, those are all commercial aircraft that use typical, kind of typical architectures. The key is the 787 is an oddball. The, the 787 went to a no bleed architecture. There is no bleed air on that aircraft whatsoever. It uses all electrical for everything. So it's got a different weird electrical. The generators on the APU are different. The generators on the engine are different. They're actually starter generators. But so we have accessories. What other accessories might be on here? So we've got a starter, we've got a generator. What's this thing down here? What do you think down in the front? So there's going to be an oil pump in it. That's more integral into this. There is an oil sump in here, right? It's going to have an oil bath in it. Uses turbine oil just like any other turbine engine. What else is on there? A fuel pump and fuel control. Okay, we got to be able to control the fuel that goes in here. It is a turbine engine. It has to be operated like one, right? It's got to maintain speed. Some may have a hydraulic pump. That's very uncommon, but it's out there. There's possible. Okay. Do you see, where do you think we get pressurized air from? Pneumatic. What's our pneumatic source here? To run our ECS, what? Bleed air. So there is going to be a bleed air port. It's not really shown here. Somewhere off of essentially this diffuser before it goes to the combustion chamber. Okay, we're going to have a bleed air port. And that goes right to the bleed system on the aircraft. So small APUs, bleed air is taken directly off of the engine compressor, the compressor that's also supplying air for the combustion process. Right? 
Larger APUs look something like this, and they're very similar. It's very similar. We still have our air inlet. You can see that's kind of the typical square air inlet. So at the bottom of the air inlet, we have, what's this thing here? That's our gas, what's called our gas producer compressor. Okay. And then that brings the air out and into this area is our combustor. And then that comes into a turbine. You can see this one's got several turbine stages instead of just one, right? It's a little, it's bigger. This is based on, this is a Garrett, if I remember right. Yeah, Garrett, GTCP331. So combustion section and turbine, and then the exhaust out to the right. But then this one has, if you look closely in here, there's another compressor right here, just to the left. Now it's not in, here's our main core. From the inlet to the right is our main core, but there, there is this little inlet grate inside of there that goes to this compressor. And that's what's called a pneumatic supply compressor. So this still drives a gearbox. It still has a starter. It still has a generator. It still has a fuel pump. But now we've got this additional compressor that is going to send air out through this duct right here. It's called a pneumatic supply compressor. It's, it's on larger APUs, they add the second compressor. It's still driven directly on the main shaft. Okay. And if you look here, you can see that it actually tees in, and there's a valve here, with we can still pull air off of the main compressor too. So now you've got the ability to pull air from the main compressor or from the pneumatic supply compressor. And this valve, what what kind of chooses between the two. There's a check valve in here. What chooses between the two will be automatically managed by the APU, the engine itself. It's not something you as an operator are even going to care about, okay? Unless something goes wrong, and then you got to fix it, right? But in normal operation, whether air is pulled from the pneumatic supply compressor or from the uh, gas producer compressor, right? air comes out here uh, uh, into the diffuser, and then goes out, can come out through this duct to the, you know, to the rest of it. And then this is where it hooks up with the rest of the airplane right here. The pneumatic system on the rest of the airplane on the bottom. So whether it comes from one or the other is going to be determined by the APU automatically. Um, and it's based on load and demand. Okay, as you need more air, um, it can it can port additional air here. And so this because now we're on larger aircraft where we have more space we can put this physically is just a bigger you know because you add that additional compressor this thing is bigger than the other apu that you saw it's bigger than this one right here okay so you can fit it on a bigger aircraft and a bigger aircraft consequently is going to probably need more airflow as well apus typically live in the tail most most aircraft most twin engine aircraft, which and, and quad engine aircraft, so uh, you know the exceptions. We're not talking about 727 here, uh, or the TriStar, the 1011 TriStar. But most twin engine and four engine aircraft, they put the APU in somewhere in the tail, and the majority of the time it's in the very back of the tail. You can see, I kind of drew where the vertical stat was. APU lives back here. There's often access doors, or the whole cone comes off. So air comes in at the top, goes through, here's that kind of rectangular opening, and then exhausts out the very tip of the tail. And there's a, this line right here, there's a firewall. These things are sealed off from the rest of the aircraft. So air intake, the plenum is part of the inlet, the APU itself, and the exhaust back there. And then on the bottom, access doors. And these often, they're on the bottom. There's typically two of them on the bottom of the airplane like this, and they swing open that way in order to, you know, you look up and there's the APU above your head. I've got some pictures in a minute that show it. So when they're installed, some you can remove the whole tail cone. You'll see something like this. So here's the APU. Here's the inlet. This one just inlets right from the side of the airplane, the exhaust. There's another little air duct here. Any idea what that one's for? What else might have to be cooled? What would have to be cooled oftentimes? So it probably goes to a starter or a generator. The APU itself is self-temperature self managing, but it's, it's probably an air-cooled, typically it's an air-cooled starter. I was going to run there. Generators really don't generate as much heat, but 
but starters can get real hot real fast. So this is a fairly small airplane. This is the tail of like a, an Ember 120. So this is a little one. Now this one does have a starter generator. This is a DC aircraft, so you don't see two on there. You'll just see one starter generator. Here's something a little bit bigger. You can see our APU inlet door right here. So that's where the air is going to get sucked in just above the, the horizontal stab. And then there's an exhaust at the back. If we look at the plane more from the back, here's our inlet door. You can see it's a door that swings open when it's running, but then it shuts. These are, they're controlled by the, most of these APUs have either older ones have um, like a logic unit, a bunch of relays and stuff like that. Newer ones are a, essentially a FADEC. There's a computer that controls the APU. And it also controls things like the doors, it controls that, that bleed air valve, it controls the fuel metering. Okay, all that stuff's typically done behind the scenes for you. There's really no control. There's no throttle for the APU. Um, there's no power lever for the APU. There's usually very little indication. We'll look at indication and control in a little bit. But the door will open and then the exhaust back there, usually the exhaust is open. And you can see here are those doors on the bottom. You can kind of see the split line, the left door and the right door, to be able to get up into that area. On some aircraft, rather than putting them at the tip of the tail, they put them a little bit further forward. And so here, there is an exhaust duct that comes out the side. So rather than coming out the tip of the tail, they put it in a duct. Now this one's situated a little bit differently. Uh, and this one was moved forward. This is forward for weight and balance purposes. And so now it's not in that very tip tail cone, so this one will have a different type of enclosure. We'll look at enclosures, but it's essentially inside of a titanium box inside of there. Why does there have to be a metal, you know, I mentioned here, let me go back right here, you can see there's a metal, a solid piece of metal here. The other one might be enclosed in a box. What's that for? What's that? Forms a firewall. Okay, anywhere that you have a combustion device, you have to have a firewall. So same thing, where you have engines, you know, these are all wing-mounted engines. The pylon itself is, has a firewall in it, if you have wing-mounted engines. Or like these ones on the tail, there's a firewall inside this pylon. Basically a sheet of, of steel or high temp steel or titanium um, that has everything going through it, like every, every fuel line going through it, every hydraulic line going through it, everywhere you got a cable, it's sealed. And it has like fuel, hydraulic, pneumatic lines. They've got a shutoff valve. And uh, where cables go through, they have to have like air seals and boots and stuff around them. And that way, if there is a fire, you know, the most, the highest likelihood of a fire is in your engines or your APU, somewhere you got combustion. There's a dividing firewall that would prevent that from being able to spread into the airframe. All right, let the engine burn up, but don't get into the airframe and you're good to go. So this has the exhaust on the side. The inlet on this one's on the opposite side of the aircraft. So you can't see it in this picture. When we look up, that's what it looks like. So here's the door swung open. Here's the firewall on the right. And so you can see, is this a small one or a large one based on the ductwork you see there? This is a large APU, why? It's got this T ducting coming from two places. It's coming from the pressurization compressor. It's also coming off of the engine compressor. Okay, And that comes up here. And on the other side of this firewall, just forward of it, there's going to be a valve there. There's a shutoff valve. Okay, Anywhere we've got different sensors in here. Uh, you've got, you can see this bundle of large, large wires coming off. There's two of them. What are those, you think? Two large bundles of wires, what are those going to? So one's going to the starter, one's going to the generator. I can tell you from looking at it, this right here, based on numbers of wires, this is probably a gen, no, that's the starter, that's the generator up there, this is the starter down here. So. To get these in and out, we got these cool little things called fishing poles, fish poles. So you, you hook the top of, they're like little cranes. You hook them up inside. They've got a, a cable with a hook that comes out and essentially clips to the APU. Little crank down here to dole out the cable. 
you, un, you hook it up, take the weight off it, disconnect all your firewall connections. So you're going to have, you know, fuel line going to the firewall. You're going to have electrical going to the firewall. You're going to have other electrical for the starter. You're probably going to have some control wiring, very small wires, can unplug type things. You're going to have your pneumatic duct, get all that stuff unhooked. And then you disconnect your engine mounts. And then use these two. You just put there and crank it, and it lowers the APU down nice and nice and smoothly. Easy to get to. Got to have the supervisor there, right? What are these guys all missing? Yep. They got built in. They got like the safety contacts. The safety squint. Okay. See the picture of people welding, holding a piece of paper so they don't get sunburned. Here's the kind of a diagram of that one where the exhaust came out the side. So inside the tail, here's that titanium enclosure I was talking about. Uh, it has a door that would go, they have doors that go on the front of them, or actually it's the back of them. Technically this is the back, the front of the airplane is that way. Uh, and in this case, they often have a way, some kind of a beam or crane that runs across the top of the bay, or that can be installed temporarily. It's a piece of ground support equipment. Uh, that's used to help bring the, the APU out, and then it would go down through. There's a hatch on the bottom of the airplane that's used to drop it out. Okay. So removal installation, pretty straightforward. Unhook everything. Unhook the mounts. Use the proper support equipment to drop it out of the aircraft. Control from a for APUs is very basic. So here's an here's an older one. This is the kind of a line drawing of the 757 or 767. This is the entire control in the flight deck for the APU. You have a switch to turn it off, on, and then it's got a start position. It's kind of like the key on your car. You turn it to start, that triggers the start. You let go, it snaps back to the on position. There's a light. The run light lights up when it's running. Fault light lights up if anything goes wrong. When it's off, what kind of an indication do you get? None. Normal flight condition is the APU is not running. So dark flight deck concept would say that you have no lights if the APU is off. But if the APU is running, you have a light lit up. That tells you that's not normal flight condition. You can have it. It's probably a green run light. Green means, okay, it can be on, but normally it wouldn't be on. Here's another example of an APU control. This is on an aircraft that, this is out of the 175, I think, or 190, um, with a, uh, that has an ICAST system. So any of the APU indication in this case is going to be on the ICAST display. So again, it's got an off, it's got an on, a start position, and then it's got an emergency stop, which basically closes all the fuel valves and everything. In ICAS aircraft, older ones, again, 757, 767, your, your indication is often limited to the um, exhaust gas temp and RPM. That's about all you need to know about them. Some will have oil level as well. Or if the oil level is low, then in this case, you get an oil quantity message. So as long as the quantity is not there, then you have a proper amount of oil in the, air, in the engine. New aircraft looks, you can see, pretty much the same. APU, if it's running, it'll say 100%. Gives you the exhaust gas temperature, in this case, 435 degrees Celsius. And if oil level is low, you'd get a message that would pop up here in your in your cast messages, your crew alerting system messages. Some of these newer ones, if you go into, they do have maintenance. If, if, if you do need to see more information about it for troubleshooting for, for like what you guys do, um, they'll often have an APU section in the uh, maintenance data computer or, or uh, onboard maintenance system, OMS. Uh, that you can go into, and there it might have additional details. It may be able to give you an actual oil quantity. It might be able to give you fault codes or fault history. 
So if there's an APU that's been faulting out, you can see what log did. It'll actually tell you, you know, what specific unit or part on there maybe caused the fault. Or if it's overspeed, you know, if there's an overspeed event that got going too fast. Or an underspeed event. These can have underspeed events. APUs want to run at 100% all the time. There's no throttle, anything. You turn them on, they speed up, they fire up, and they go to 100%, and that's where they stay. Fat, dumb, and happy the entire time they're running. And if for some reason your control system has a fault and that RPM is able to goes beyond that, right? Too much fuel gets put in it essentially. They, they will often, they'll have the ability, they'll automatically shut down with an overspeed. Or if you put too much load on them all of a sudden, you know, say for some reason the generator really bogs it down, really puts a lot of resistance, it can slow it down. You could have an underspeed event or there's not enough fuel going to it. The other thing you can have is that those those bleed splices. For some reason, there are there are modulating valves on these for the bleed air that are called load control valves, and they control how much air is being pulled off the APU at any given time. And if that valve goes faulty, what do you think can happen? If it, what would happen if it pulls too much bleed air off of the APU? It's going to probably over temp, right? You won't get enough of that cooling air making its way into the combustion section. And so then you'll get an over temp set up. Uh, in that case, this would turn, usually it would turn red, it would log a fault in the onboard maintenance system. And then it may be able to even tell you why, you know, why. So they've gotten, there's a lot more that you can get from a modern APU than there used to be. But again, it's not available to the crew 100% of the time. Most of the time, all they're worried about is does it run, does it not run? If it's not working, they're going to call maintenance to figure it out. Pilots are not supposed to troubleshoot things. Definitely not in the air. Okay, there have been several accidents caused by flight crews trying to troubleshoot rather than fly the airplane. So they really have gone away from that. If you're in an air carrier environment, the pilots are basically, there's some troubleshooting they have to do to keep the airplane flying. But they are, they are very limited in what they are allowed or supposed to do. They have a checklist, they're supposed to stick to it and not go beyond that. Uh, so they don't make the situation any worse. So they don't even make the data available to them. A lot of times you have to be on the ground for you to be able to bring that information up. The weight on wheel sensors have to tell you you're on the ground. Okay. Where are these located? It's a lot of dial switches. Anyone, can anyone tell me where the APU's at? So there's roughly uh, five rows, right? Or five columns. One, two, three, four, five. So which column is it in? Number two? Where in number two? Top, bottom, middle? Kind of near the bottom, right there. All this, that's all you got for the APU. Okay. There's your switch. There's the light. That's that one I showed you the picture of, first of all. This is a uh, seven can't remember, either 757 or 767. They look very, very similar. So, Oftentimes there are some other control panels. So you'll see a lot of them will have like a fire control panel somewhere or an, or an external control panel. This one's located in the nose wheel well area. Why would we put a APU control panel in the nose wheel well? The what? They're used on the ground, okay, but... Why does it have to be on the outside of the airplane? So the ground crew can do it. Most of these APUs are certified where you can actually run them and walk away from the aircraft. Now you don't want to leave it totally, totally unattended, but if there's ground crews around, they've got a, you can see a fire warning horn right here. And so if anything goes wrong, they have to have an audible alert that's loud enough, and I, I don't know the specific decibels, to get the attention of people who are nearby and then they have to have a means to be able to shut them down if for some reason the automatic shutdown systems have not have failed. Okay. The APUs on most planes today, if they sense a fire or a problem, they will shut down on their own. They will automatically close off their fuel valves, their bleed valves, everything. And if that problem persists, they'll actually discharge their fire extinguishers automatically as well. 
and they have to be able to do that to be certified to le be left running unattended. But if any of that stuff happens, they have to have the ability to notify people in the vicinity that something has gone wrong, and that's what that, that, that warning horn is going to do. On there, you've got a few indicator lights for things like fire, if the fire bottle, whether it's been armed or discharged, there's a switch to manually discharge it. There's a shutdown button. Okay. So you have a way to operate them from the ground. Okay. Older aircraft indication, instead of being on ICAS, you can see here we've got RPM, EGT, and oil quantity on a flight engineer's panel. So that was kind of back in the day. Some of them have that. Not all of them do. You don't necessarily have to have all this indication in the flight deck. Especially the oil quantity, you don't have to show that. Most of the time, you can just check that. They just, just get checked with a dipstick. Here's a couple other control panels. So power, start, stop. And then this one, the, all there is is a shutdown button right up by the nose. It doesn't even have the rest of the stuff. It just has a shutdown button. And this one also has one back in the tail where the... You know, oftentimes there's one near the APU itself, as well as one near the front gear where, where ground crews typically are working. Fuel for APUs comes from the main tanks. It's the same fuel that's used to run the engines. It's run on the, the same jet fuel, Jet-A, or Jet-A-1, or whatever it is, you know, JP, whatever, if the military. Um, typically has a, a dedicated fuel pump that runs on 28 volt DC, whereas most of your engine, uh, most of the boost pumps that supply the engines are going to be 120 volt three phase AC, so they can't run until power's on. So that's, that's where the, the APU generator comes into play. We got to be able to provide power and other stuff in order to start the engines. But the APU has to be able to start from a battery. So a dedicated fuel pump runs at 28 volts DC. It has a 28 volt DC starter on it so that we can use it to get the airplane started. So we, we turn on batteries, we get the APU going. Once the APU is going, now we have bleed air and power, uh, AC power available, and now we can go through the rest of the start sequence to power up the airplane and get the engines running. Uh, so when we start, when we go to that on position, I'm gonna switch tip as an on and a start position. When we go to the on position, that's gonna send power to the fuel valve to open it. It's going to turn on a boost pump. Okay, there is usually a fuel shutoff valve as well, I guess I should say. So it's going to open the fuel valve. It's going to turn on the boost pump, running on 28 volts. And it's going to run off of what is oftentimes a dedicated 24-volt battery. So depending on the aircraft, it may or may not. The 727 does not have a dedicated APU battery. It has one battery that's used for APU starting and for emergency power. Most newer airplanes you'll see today will have two batteries on board. And one is considered the APU battery, and one is considered the emergency battery. Oftentimes, they can be both used for both situations. In fact, most of the, the ones I worked on had an APU battery and a main battery, but they would parallel during APU start under normal circumstances. So you had all that battery power available. Uh, and same thing, if you got in an emergency situation in the air, it would primarily draw, draw off the main battery, but it could draw off the APU battery. I mean, it's there, right? You may as well make it available in an emergency. So even though we had two and they were called main and APU battery, they really were effectively just two batteries. So we go then, we've turned it on, then we go to the start position and everything else is pretty much automatic. Like I said, it's either gonna be older aircraft, relays and, and transistor type things, newer aircraft, it's all solid, it's all basically a FADEC computer. And so it'll, if, there's an, if there is an air inlet door, which most do have an air inlet door, that's going to open. The fuel valve will open, those DC boost pumps start, and then once it verifies that this is open and it's got fuel, then it's going to start the starter. Now, the fuel valve here, I should say, is not the one that's going to allow fuel into the combustion chamber. Okay? By fuel valve, I'm talking about the valve that allows fuel to flow from the tanks up to the APU, like the firewall valve. Okay, but this is not putting fuel in. The starter engages, the ignition comes on. Once it gets up to typically about 10 to 20%, then 
the engine fuel control will energize and that's what's going to actually supply fuel into the combustion chamber through the uh, fuel nozzles. And you'll get ignition at that point. The APU will start up, the power will increase. At some point, you know, once it's, once it's going and it becomes self-sustaining, typically around 50-60%, the starter will disengage, the ignition will shut off, but then it's going to continue to rise up until it reaches its 100%. So, you know, if you look at a time and event graph, it looks something like this. So we start with battery on the airplanes turned on. We press the power fuel switch or we turn it to the on position. The uh, ECU, electronic control unit, another name for like an APU FADEC. So the APU computer powers up and it causes the cooling or the intake door to open. Once it's open, press the start button or move the switch to the start position. That's going to engage the starter. At 10%, the fuel solenoid is energized and the igniters come on. And soon after that, you get light off. 50% the starter cuts out, RPM continues to rise. At 99% plus four seconds, it's considered all the way fully powered. So the APU on this aircraft has an hour meter, right? It's got a little Hobbs meter for itself. Load control valves armed. That's the thing that allows you to be able to get bleed air off the airplane, uh, bleed air load control valve. So it's a shut off valve and, a, and it controls how much bleed air. So it's not just an on off valve, it's a modulator. It can open a little bit or open a lot. The generator becomes available, the ignition shuts off, and then it does an automated, it does a self-check. And at that point, again, it tries to maintain 100% RPM without over-temping as you put loads on it, various loads, electrical loads and bleed air loads. And if any of those exceed, what is it going to prioritize? What did I say it would prioritize? What do you think it will prioritize? The what? The electrical system will take priority. Why does electrical system take priority? If we're, if we're taking electrical and bleed air and our temperature starts to get too high, we're working the APU too hard, it's going to shut off bleed air first. Why do we shut off bleed air but keep electrical going? Well, the compressor is where you get your bleed air. And Oh, the engines, but the engines have generators too. Right? The, the engines can have generators too. Why would we prioritize electrical over bleed air? What's electrical running that's more crucial? Can run the pumps, the hydraulic pumps uh, for the flight controls, potentially even fly by wire system, right? You want to be able to fly the airplane? What else does electrical run? Navigation and instrumentation, okay, that's kind of important, right, to fly the airplane, right? What does the bleed air run? So it's starter, but now we're in the air. So if, if, we're, if we're having issues, we probably don't want to start the engines. At that point, we're going to, you know, they're going to stop. They're going to take a break. They're not going to try to fly the plane with no issues on the ground. So they'll stop even going through the start sequence. But what else did you say? Anti-ice, some of them can run anti-ice, not a lot. They typically can't provide, they, 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 even though they may be plumbed into the anti-ice system, um, typically they're not running them in the air, and anti-ice uses a lot of bleed air. So I guess in, in some cases they might be able to, but probably not super likely. Environmental control system, okay? What does environmental control system supply, provide? Pressurization, do we really need pressurization that bad? You can descend. What do, the, what do the crews have available to them before they, or while they're descending so they don't pass out from loss of, they have oxygen masks. So a crew's gonna put on their oxygen mask if they can't maintain pressurization. They have these big full face oxygen masks that are gonna keep them. The passengers might pass out, You'll get, the, you'll get all the masks falling. You're going to pull them on. You'll put yours on. Bag may not inflate. Put yours on before helping others, yada, yada, yada. But even if the passengers don't, they're going to be doing a crash dive. They're, they're getting down below 10,000 feet as fast as they can. But the crew, when we do oxygen, you'll see a quick donning oxygen mask that the crew has 
they can have on in less than half a second. They're in a box, they grab, there's a little squeezy thing, they grab it. When they do that, the, the head, the, the, the straps that go around their head are actually tubes. They're air tubes. And so when they squeeze it, that sends air to those. The, the thing that holds it on their head blows up about this big. It's this giant net of rubber tubes, about yay big. So they grab it, put it on, let go, and it goes and sucks it down to their head and puts the mask on them and instantly starts giving them oxygen. So the pneumatic is less important than the electrical, especially in a situation where if that's the only thing you got, you got to run those flight controls, you got to run the navigation and, and instrumentation to be able to, at that point, you're probably gliding the air, potentially gliding the airplane to the ground. Okay. Or you've lost both engine generators and you need to prioritize electrical. Okay. That wraps up APU.